uh, typically, um, you'll see a lot of time series distributed um, distributed at a, uh, at a certain frequency, consistent frequency. So like you have a daily time series, a monthly time series, um, a yearly time series, so on and so forth. Now, um, and now um, the main reason why uh, you would want to use a time series is to kind of understand how a particular um, particular entity or variable will react with respect to time. Now, um, that's kind of where a lot of the power in time series um, comes from, because it's very much like a behavioral thing. Like, you're looking at the behavior of something and trying to use that behavior to predict future actions that you can possibly adapt to. So that's why time series is particularly powerful in tons and tons of different domains. Um, it's particularly useful um, for like analyzing stock prices, climate change, weather, um, like certain factors in weather, like humidity and temperature, like that, like time series can be used to kind of for, um, with that respect to like predict, uh, to predict what's going to happen in the future. Uh, in the finance industry, they put a lot of money into into time series models. It's basically like the foundation of a lot of those algorithmic trading bots that are very popular on Wall Street. When they say there's like an algorithm trading bot with machine learning, like it's typically like based on uh, the results that a particular time series model will will have. Um, uh, and then, of course, like in advertising too, like it's extremely popular. Um, even something is uh, even something like retail, uh, where you would want to see like, oh, maybe we're selling more t-shirts in the in the summer. So therefore we need like extra shipments of t-shirts according to this time series. So tons and tons of applications. Um, um, there we go. Now, um, there are two uh, types of data. There's the cross-sectional and time series, or it also goes by long longitudinal in some, uh, in some contexts. But uh, the main difference between cross-sectional and uh, and the time series data is you can kind of think of cross-sectional as a snippet in time where you want to see um, where, where you want to analyze um, data like in independently of time. You want to have like a piece. Uh, you want to be in that position where time doesn't particularly matter and analyze. Um, the attributes and um, the population within that given uh, within that given snippet, while um, a time series will take will will analyze uh, a single entity like over over a long period of time. So you can think of like the cross sectional data is you're analyzing multiple entities at a given at a singular given instance, and then time series are multiple you're uh, analyzing one entity over multiple different periods. So you, so I wrote down this example um, uh, as like a bank loan default because it's, it's, it's a very popular um, beginner data science project where a bank, um, a bank might wanna analyze the attributes that result in like a, that result in a, a particular amount of loan defaults by looking at the cross-sectional data. So they'll get the attributes by looking at the cross-sectional data. However, they'll get the general behaviors of um, they'll get the general behaviors of loan uh, of loan defaults for their particular bank by looking at the number of loan defaults month to month, and that's how you uh, that's more of a time series problem. Now this is where things get pretty confusing because there can be cross-sectional time series data <laughs> where you have multiple different entities being analyzed at multiple different periods. Um, and there are ways, uh, there are ways that people figured out how to handle that. Yep. And um, I guess I will uh, um, finish this slide and then ask any questions, but the, the main reason why time series is so important is because if you really think about it, everything in the everything has a particular behavior with respect to time. Because if you if you think about it, time applies to literally everything. Now, I don't mean to get into philosophy here, but time uh, time applies to everything in in the universe, and as a result, everything exhibits a certain behavior. So. By understanding these previous behaviors and patterns, 
Uh, it'll give us an idea of what's going to happen in the future. And it allows particular organizations to preemptively adapt to certain conditions that they predict in the future in order to give them, um, in order to accomplish their business goals a bit more efficiently. And again, like this doesn't just have to be um, finance, like a humanitarian organization they might be looking at a particular country that has exhibited um, that has exhibited earthquakes in the past, or particular, um, or they're at higher risk of, um, or they're at higher risk of certain events occurring in in the future. And it might be like a good idea to preemptively send like certain supplies there, or preemptively prepare that particular country, depending on which seasons are going to experience high levels of uh, high levels of danger. And then it's also like important to science, as I said, like um, a lot of climate, uh, a lot of climate science is uh, based on these time series analysis and how they project uh, certain, uh, how they project climate change will occur in the near future. And it's, uh, it's very useful for analyzing this behavior in order to adjust our uh, behaviors in the present. So hopefully that they will bring those down. And of course, like the big thing is finance stocks. Uh, do, uh, do I need? Do I even need to say more? Like uh, hedge funds, Wall Street banks—they live and die based on whether an investment is good or not. So a time series of an of a stock's previous behavior might affect how it will uh, might affect how it will behave in the future. Um, yes. Uh, any any questions so far? So I, I know. Uh, when we were in our when we were talking yesterday about the presentation and everything, you said you will, might be a little pressed for time to stay within our sixty minutes. <laughs> we don't have any questions yet. Typically, we'll okay. see them come in. Uh, we'll stop, ask for questions, and then five minutes later they start to come in. So why don't we go ahead and keep going? And then in the next, I know we'll stop again at some other point in time, and then we'll we'll answer some questions then. Yep, absolutely. So um, now this is very important. So when you're looking at a time series problem, it's very uh, tempting to uh, to go gung ho, dive right into the data, and start creating your time series model. But it's important to take a step back and think about uh, the problem first before you actually jump into this data. Now, um, when you're looking at a time series, you're going to want, want to consider many different, uh, very important features. The first extremely important feature is you're going to want to understand which variable you want to, which variable will be most appropriate to solve your particular business goals. And you want to isolate that variable. Um, it, this is very important. Uh, isolating that specific variable is uh, is very important because it's going to be the basis in which your model is built. So you want to make sure that not only the metric you've chosen is good, but that um, the way you're going to aggregate it and distribute it over a particular time series is um, will accomplish whatever business goals you have. Because if your if your metric is off, then you're essentially predicting something that just you're building a model on something that won't really create any business value. So, uh, the single most important thing that I would consider is uh, your metric, your variable, like what you're planning to build your time series on. You want to isolate that, and have a good idea of how you want to aggregate that over. Like, do you want it to? Do you want the sum over certain? Uh, the sum over, like the sum of. Um, the sum of investments in a in a given month. Do you want the average investment in a given month? Do you want uh, uh, so on and so forth, so, or do you want the number of investments in a given month? So, um, so so on and so forth. So like, so it's important to isolate that. Uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to identify the relevant period in which your time series is going to uh, is go in which you want your time series to be. Um, to, be, to span. So like if you want to analyze traffic patterns, uh, cars were around since, I don't know, like what, the 1920s, <laughs> early 1900s. So um, you're, the traffic patterns in the early 1900s are not going to be very relevant to today's traffic patterns. So you want to make sure that the periods that you're including in your model are actually going to be relevant to your, um, to your actually 
to your actual problem statement. Like if you're doing an analysis for modern traffic patterns for VDOT, like going back to the early 1900s isn't going to provide a lot of value for that. So making sure you restrict your, your period is also very helpful. And then finally, like the frequency in which you want your time series to be distributed, like um, month, year, remember time series, you want it to be like, you want it to be very consistently distributed throughout um, throughout a bar throughout a various frequency. So um, this is important because certain uh, because certain increments will be more useful to like a particular uh, to a particular business school than others. Like if you're looking, if you want to understand how much revenue you're taking in or business performance, um, you would want to look at maybe quarters or months. Uh, looking at it uh, day by day might not might be a little bit too granular to be useful for um, might be too granular to be useful for what you're about to analyze. So, so that's uh, that's pretty important as well. Now, um, now it's the time like we kind of get into more of the technical aspects of of um, of time series analysis. Now, um, a time series you can kind of think of it uh, made in four different components. So there's uh, the trend, the seasonality, the cycles, and the uh, irregularities. So essentially, irregularities are noise, you know. <laughs> so essentially, um, a trend is how your time series is moving uh, with respect to time very gradually. So, uh, so essentially when you're, you can see in this particular graphic, uh, the trend of the time series is moving slightly up as, um, as the years progress. Now um, you can see like these teeth right here. Uh, you can see like these uh, mini fluctuations throughout the trend. This is called seasonality. Now, seasonality is very interesting because they describe very predictable, uh, very predictable fluctuations between time series they, um, that you're uh, that you'll be able to capture, and that's kind of where those teeth come in. Um, then you have cycles. So these cycles are these big fluctuations over here. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what's the difference between a cycle and um, a cycle and uh, a seasonality. Well, the main difference is that uh, a cycle does not have a fixed interval in which the values around uh, the values around the trend will go up and down. So, um, so essentially, a cycle is almost a part of the is almost a part of the trend. It's kind of like a subtrend. You can you can say rather than like a regular behavior, the uh, the time series will exhibit. And that's uh, and that's the uh, very big importance uh, between that uh, between that difference because it, because as we go along there are um, the cycles kind of captured uh, in the trend analysis within our models but like the seasonality is going to be something that we're going to incorporate separately as like an additional build build on to our models and then basically like uh, the irregularity you can kind of see it um, here within the um, uh, you can kind of see it here, like these mini teeth within the cycles. Um, these are those unexpected changes that our time series will exhibit. This is like the white noise, uh, the random noise that you would expect any data to have uh, that will be present within our time series. Now, um, another important term that is in, visualized here is, well, I guess it's technically visualized here. It's called a lag. And I will be using this term throughout, so it's important to explain what I mean here. A lag is kind of an, identi an, an identifier for a particular um, increment of time. So, like, so you would say that um, uh, yesterday would be lag y t minus one. The day before would be lag t minus two. The day before that would be la lag t minus three. So it's important to kind of identify. Um, it, it is essentially a generalized term that identifies a period in time that you're referring to. And um, it's very important in time series analysis. Like this is used all the time. And then, um, yeah, like trends and cycles. Um, a, a cycle is essentially like a kind of a piece of a trend and they're typically captured together. Yeah, um, are there any questions for this? Cause this, cause I went through like a lot of very dense information. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should give it a minute and see if anybody has any questions. Cause I know um, for most people here, this is probably something new to them. Um, so they might not even know, uh, I know I don't really even know the right question to ask. <laughs> so so if there's 
If anybody has any questions, just a reminder, if you're in Zoom, go ahead and use that Q and question and answer tab, Q and A. Um, it helps me keep everything organized. And then if you are on one of our live streams, that could be uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, whatever chat you have available to you, go ahead and throw your questions in there and then we will pull them in into Zoom for you so that we can get those answered. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, there aren't any dumb questions, um, uh, uh, feel free to ask, we'll get them answered um, and make sure that we're, we're learning something and taking that with us when we leave. Um, but uh, for now, Alex, even here's a question. Uh, what does YT stand for in the lag phrase? So YT is just um, the value as of today. So it's the most current value. And then like Y T minus one, you can kind of think of that as like Y uh, time minus one, which would be the value of yesterday. But yeah, that, that's a that's a very excellent question. It's supposed to be like Y under um, Y like subscript T, <laughs> but uh, I don't have LaTeX. So <laughs> um, so it, so Y T is just the, the most current value. That's a that's a very excellent question. All right, Scott, thank you for that. Um, OK, so if any more questions come on in. Uh, you know, we'll make sure to stop and answer those. But for now, Alex, why don't we continue? Yeah, absolutely. So um, moving off of what I said uh, earlier, um, I want I kind of want to get into like, oh, another question popped up, but I'll answer after. Um, I want to get into like the decomposition models. So like the reason why decomposition, uh, de decomposing our models is so useful is that it can give you, it can separate your model into different pieces so you can see each individual part uh, each each so you can isolate each individual part and get a better idea of how it's acting. So um, so by looking at so first you want to determine when you're decomposing your model you want to determine if your model is additive or multiplicative. Now you can see that uh, the additive model the seasonality is kind of is consistent throughout time. The fluctuations or the behavior is pretty consistent. With a multiplicative seasonality you can see that the seasonality tends to tends to change throughout time. It tends to it tends to get like the amplitude of each season tends to get uh, far greater. So by doing this, you can kind of um, you can by determining if your model is uh, multiplicative or additive, you can decompose it into like the trend component, the seasonal component, and the noise component. And you can get a better idea of how of maybe what your season is, what your uh, how your model's acting over time. Like um, you can get a better idea of stationarity, which we'll get into uh, very soon as well. And um, how this is done is essentially um, these components are found individually and then subtracted from the subtracted in the in the case of the additive series from the general time series and then divided. Um, from the general time series in terms of like the mul multiplicative series. So like in general, this is how, um, this is how you can get a good idea of how your model's behavior is going to go. So you can isolate each of those components that we went over from the previous slide. Now, uh, now we're getting a lot more questions here. <laughs> yeah, I think we just needed a gentle nudge. <laughs> <laughs> do you wanna, do you wanna pause and answer some or do you wanna? Yes. Uh, okay. This this is a good like stopping point. Okay, this, sounds uh, good. Model, yeah. Sounds good. So first question, will slides be available after this? Uh, we'll talk to Alex and um, he's kind of nodding his head yes. So so I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, and when we when we post the recording, we'll post the slides as a resource along with a couple of other things I know Alex has in them so that it's mm -hmm. easy to access for everyone. Um, but first, Alex, what is the difference between irregularities and seasonality? Yep, uh, that's that's an excellent question. So it's it's very um, so you can kind of think of um, an irregularity as an unpredicted change that happens within your time series versus seasonality, which is very consistent. So like an irregularity would be um, you'll see kind of blips here and there, like uh, miniature blips here and there that represent more so noise, uh, more so noise and a certain level of randomness rather than um, expected trends that you'll see, um, expected trends that you'll see um, at, uh, with a given season. Like say for example, you're selling ice cream in the summer. Uh, you're, you're selling ice cream throughout the year, you're an ice cream company. 
you would expect your season to go, um, it'd be low in the winter because uh, very few people would, <laughs> would want ice cream in the winter. And then you, it would go up as the summer, as the summer comes around, because more and more people want ice cream in the summer and then it will go down. So that season of the ri of rising in the summer and going down in the fall uh, for your ice cream fields will represent your season. Now, in, you might have a case where you release like you release a very popular new product in say January or February. You'll see a little blip uh, at the beginning of the month, and then you'll see the regular season. That little blip would be the irregularity because you won't be releasing. Uh, products at the same time, same place every single year. Well, maybe sometimes you will, but like in, in this example, you wouldn't. So, and also when you release a product, you wouldn't expect it to be instantly popular. But if you release like a very popular product, you'll get like a little blip and then the season will just carry on. And that little blip would be like the noise that you that you would experience. Mm -hmm. I love that question. That is a really good one. So in this, this person, I also had a follow-up question to it, which is so how can these... Uh, these irregularities in seasonality, how can they influence the future? Uh, that is that is excellent. So um, so the irregularities and uh, within the seasonality, um, you essentially uh, they they can provide a slight bit of bias, um, a slight bit of bias to your model. So it's important you kind of account for that. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, um, to, to, uh, prevent that bias from affecting our, our model, like there are certain, um, there are certain precautions that you can take, like you can make the model, you can try, uh, some smoothing methods. You can potentially try some, um, some averaging, some differencing. So, uh, well, differencing also handles like trend analysis as well, but, but basically like having this noise is something that you'll um that you can essentially deal with to prevent that bias but does affect the model like it, it like it may provide like especially if um certain certain errors or certain blips are big enough that cause like particular outliers it can definitely add a level of bias towards the model that we're trying to fit okay um let's go through a couple of more i hope this one makes sense to you because i don't understand it um, how do you fit the y equals mx plus x equation to the model? Does it does it have to be fit like an RSME error? Yeah, that is a that is an excellent question. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so <laughs> you're kind of you're um, you're kind of spoiling it. <laughs> yeah, Rob, you're but, you're jumping too far ahead for us. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All we're, right. We're gonna dive into that, but there's a specific, um, but essentially, like autoregression is is a particular thing that we'll get into. It's a linear equation with using past lags as the a fitting uh, using past lags. So that's how we'll um, we'll get into it later. Okay, and then um, uh, we'll ask this question, and then we'll move on because Grav actually asked a second question, and I have a feeling you'll probably get into it a little later as well. Um, so, uh, but this one is, um, could you clear the air about the difference between cyclo and seasonal? I think, does that make sense? Yep. yep. Absolutely. <laughs> so essentially the main difference is that a, se uh, a seasonal pattern has like a very predictable, um, a very predictable timeline in which you expect it to happen. However, a site, a cyclic pattern will not have a particular, uh, will not have a predictable uh, period in which it will happen. So like a cycle can happen. Um, a cycle is, is unpredictable in its nature. It just means that certain, um, it just means that uh, your values are going up and down around the general trend. However, like a seasonal seasonality does have like a particular time frame in which you expect, uh, in in which you expect like the um, the increases and decreases to occur. Okay. So yeah, that is a really good question. I I really want to emphasize like the difference between cyclic and seasonal because it's very very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, for these other questions, um, Gaurav, again, I think you're jumping ahead a little bit with Euclidean distance and time series, so uh, we'll save that one for the end. And then I know there's a question by Kumar, it's a little longer, so Kumar, we'll save your question for the end as well. So Alex, why don't you go ahead and we can, we can continue. Yep, 
so um, the next thing I want to go to, I want to hop into is the first um, aspect to time series modeling, which is essentially uh, called autoregression. Now, autoregression is essentially taking your, um, is essentially predicting a current value based on the, based on the past values. So you can kind of think of it as a linear regression model that you're fitting. However, um, however, you can see that um, the past values, uh, however, it's, um, it's taking in the past values as the inputs in order to predict the previous value. And it's fitting, um, it's fitting a particular uh, line to that in order to optimally uh, come out with the best equation to predict the, uh, to predict the current value. Um, now this is, and, uh, now these are multiplied by coefficients and generally fit, uh, generally fit to our, um, to our data. And of course, like an error term is added to this in order to account for that, uh, white noise. Now a moving average is kind of like the very interesting counterpart to an autoregressive model. Now a moving average model takes, uh, takes past residuals. For each term and fits a and fits like a line to those past residuals, and, and cr kind of creates a linear equation by fitting uh, a line to those past residuals, and um, this essentially creates uh, the moving average portion of um, of our model, where it's able to account for particular like shocks and um, particular instant shocks and. Um, and uh, instantaneous changes that our model might incur throughout um, throughout uh, our um, throughout our fitted modeling process. So, moving average is uh, is also like a very powerful technique to take in that um, to take in the error terms or shocks from past values and kind of incorporate that to predict uh, the current value. Now, um, putting this all together. Um, is the autoregressive moving average model. Now, um, by incorporating the, um, the shock absorption from the moving average, as well as the uh, power of the previous lags, we can create a, a general time series model that will be used to predict uh, the, next, uh, the next value in whatever, um, in whatever system that we have. And this is kind of like the basis of a lot of time series, uh, of a lot of time series modeling uh, out there. And I feel like this is a good place to stop uh, for, stop for some more questions. Uh, okay, am I unmuted now? <laughs> yep, you are unmuted. <laughs> okay. Cool. I was like, once I can find where my mouse is, I can unmute myself. Um, all right. So uh, this this question, I think it kind of goes back to where we stopped um, uh, just before. Um, but does this decomposition depend on random change of the series? Decomposition depend on random change of the series. Um, I suppose it's uh, so it. It depends on, so uh, the residual error is a part of the decomposition. Like it is, uh, like the noise is kind of accounted for within the uh, within the decomposition. Uh, in turn, if, if that's what you mean by like, is it affected by random change? Um, I would say, I would say like it is incorporated within it. So it is something that it is something that is uh, that is like fundamentally a part of like the decomposition. I, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> That's all we can do. Um, um, and then I think I mean I think this question is kind of answered based off of what we were just going over. But will you be talking about some topics such as uh, the ARIMA models? Yes, uh, that is actually coming up. Um, Coming up next, I will explain the uh, the differences between the ARMA model and the ARIMA model. Yep. So Ibrahim, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, maybe Kumar Kumar's question is also that long one that you might be able to see, Alex. Um, that is also about ARIMA modeling. So maybe we can save that one until after we go over it, and then and then we can answer that one. Um, yeah. I know, and I know our live streams are a little delayed. So if you are on a live stream and you've asked a question. Sorry if it seems like we're getting to it after the fact. It's just uh, we're a little bit ahead of you. So 
Um, but Alex, that's good for now, and we can continue. Yep, absolutely. So um, now this is now before we get into the ARIMA modeling, I know everybody's really excited about ARIMA. I want to explain the the importance of stationarity. So. Um, essentially, when a time series is stationary, it means that uh, particular attributes of said time series remain constant over time. Now, this is important because it essentially means that our time series has a defined mean and variance. Now, if a time series is non-stationary, then we don't have those uh, and we don't have those aspects. It'll be very difficult for us to fit a time series to our particular data. So it's very important to uh, for our time series to be stationary in order to actually execute our um, our ARMA model. Like our, our like the ARMA model assumes stationarity when um, when you're performing it. So so that's very so it's important to like it's important to test for that and it's important to adjust for that. Now um, you can check stationarity uh, using what is called the augmented uh, Dickey Fuller test. And basically, the, if a time series is above, that means that, or uh, essentially, the null hypothesis is that it's not stationary, and that essentially, what is known as a root term exists within your uh, within your time series that's that's affecting like the mean and variance. And the alternate hypothesis is that your time series is stationary. So you want to, uh, so essentially you want to see that, um, you want to see uh, the Dickey Fuller test like below or around uh, 0 0.05. Now, what if your time series is not stationary, especially if we um, assume that it is, because you can kind of see like, even in the examples going up here, these aren't stationary time series. You know, like a lot of time series are not, uh, a lot of time series are not stationary. So how do we account for that stationarity? Well, this is where the ARIMA model comes in. Now, um, the main difference between the ARIMA model and the ARMA model is, th is that I in the middle, that means, uh, that stands for integration. Now, if a time series is not stationary, what the ARIMA model does is it differences the um, it differences the past and current values of the time series and takes these differences and fits a time series to these differences. So essentially, what you do in order to find the uh, what is known as the integration order of an ARIMA model is you um, you difference your series. You take the past and the current um, value of your particular series. And you difference them until stationarity um, until stationarity is achieved. And you can kind of check this with the Dickey Fuller test. There are other statistical tests that can test for um, that can test for stationarity. Excuse me, but essentially um, the ARIMA model is important because the R model assumes stationarity, and the ARIMA model incorporates this integration as into its mathematical formula in order to um, in order to perform that level of station in order to get that level of stationarity and um, that your model can be performed with. And this is kind of why you don't see a lot of ARMA models used. Uh, you don't see a lot of R models used in time series analysis. You typically see ARIMA models used because it has that built-in differencing. And I think I'm going to um, actually let me go. Uh, let me go over seasonality before I go before I ask any additional questions because this is also uh, this kind of builds into everything. Now you might be wondering, all that stuff that we went over previously is not seasonal. So our model is going. So the simple ARIMA model is going to have a lot of difficulty capturing uh, those seasonality trends that are present within our data set. And this is where the, Sar the SARIMA model comes in. Now, the SARIMA model is important because it essentially take, it essentially creates um, uh, seasonal counterparts of, um, seasonal counterparts of each individual aspect of our ARIMA model. It takes a seasonal autoregressive component, it makes a seasonal moving average component, and it makes a seasonal integration component. And this is based on looking, uh, you, you essentially get information on this by looking at the various seasonal periods of, um, of, various, um, uh, of various time series. 
And um, you can, uh, and by looking at the lags at various seasonal periods of the time series, you can derive your optimal uh, seasonal components from those and add them to your non-seasonal components in order to, uh, in order to create a very, very powerful time series that, uh, that not only captures the trends, the, um, the trends uh, to a certain aspect of the noise, but it will also, uh, the cycles, but it will also capture the seasonality, which the original Arima model has a very ha uh, hard time doing. And I think that it's a good time to ask questions before I move forward because I went over, I went over a lot of very important stuff. Perfect. And I think this is kind of a good time to answer Kumar's question. So uh, okay. Kumar says, thanks for this topic. Can you tell me if, if there are any, if there's any prediction can be made with numbers with time series data? If yes, what algorithm should I use? I've used ARIMA, uh, what we just went over, uh, se seasonality ARIMA in my prediction modeling sometime back. And I learned that random forest is a better choice. Uh, basically, linear regression won't work for my predict predictive modeling as the data is random. Do you have any advice? That is that's a very interesting predicament. So, um, so basically, it is actually possible to mold time series data into uh, cross sectional data, and then use uh, certain traditional machine learning methods in order to in order to make predictions from there. But if you're looking for a more sophisticated algorithm, um, a more sophisticated algorithm, a more sophisticated algorithm compared to ARIMA and SARIMA models, um, there are uh, there's like uh, long-term, short-term, or long-term, short memory uh, neural networks, uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, Facebook profit, or I guess. Well, it's it's confusing because uh, Facebook profit was made when Facebook was still Facebook, but now I guess it would be called Meta Profit. <laughs> no, <I'm> but <laughs> it's still technically it's it's called Facebook Profit, but I guess if it were modern, it would be called Meta Profit. But um, Facebook Profit is a very powerful time series library that incorporates um, what is called uh, spectral analysis or uh, Fourier series in order to imitate seasonality. And um, that can potentially be used if you want something a little bit more powerful for uh, for certain time series modeling that you want to predict. Also, Facebook uh, Facebook profit also takes into account holidays as well, which are fairly important. Uh, which are fairly so basically, it takes irregularities and it turns them more into cyclical holidays. Or I guess it wouldn't even be, I guess cyclical would be the best way to describe it. It turns them into holidays so that those irregularities can become more predictable. So yeah, uh, just uh, just my piece, uh, just my piece uh, of advice. But uh, yeah, you can all, but if all this fails and you prefer to work on a cross-sectional data, there are a lot of good articles out there that'll teach you how to take um, take each lag and kind of look at look at the lags as like a cross-sectional um, as a cross-sectional set rather than like a time series set. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then I am going to ask one of Gaurav's questions. Uh, since um, all the data points or or since since they are all data points, can we fit Euclidean distance and such in a time series? Since there are all data points, including in distance and such into a time series. And, and this was asked at the very beginning, so it might be referring to something that was on a slide. So, um, so yes, you could, well, depending on what your time series would be, you could use Euclidean distance as a metric within your time series in order to um, in, in, in kind of analyze like a specific Euclidean distance uh, over time. So I, I understand um, the, the question, it's a good question because like we typically think about like space and time being two different things, but um, you can use something like Euclidean distance and fit a time series based on that metric. For example, if it's like, <clears throat> for example, if um, you're, if like there's, um, like a fungus that moves a certain uh, that that moves a certain amount of distance from a particular point each day, and you want to see how often the fungus moves. Like you might want to um, like maybe you can kind of fit that into like 
find the Euclidean distance between the fungus, uh, the fungus's coordinates and the central coordinates at which you're, uh, at which the fungus started and use that uh, Euclidean distance as your metric throughout your time series. I, I certainly hope that I answered the question he, he, that I provided the answer to the question he was looking for, because that is a, it is interesting to think about time in terms of or space in terms of time. Like it's a very interesting, like it's a very interesting to think about it like that. Okay, um, and then this one's from Daniel or Jennifer. Sorry if I'm Daniel Jennifer. Anyways, um, is Arima model is an Arima model a statistical model a statistical model or a statistical learning model? That is a very excellent question. <laughs> so, um, so I suppose the difference between a statistical model is more so like um, you're is more so like you're using statistics. You're just you. It's not really learning anything, right? Uh, a statistical model is just uh, is just kind of using the information in order to predict further, while uh, a learning model primarily learns and adjusts. Now, uh, to my understanding, a lot of these coefficients are um, are fitted values. So I think there is some learning done uh, with the uh, with the ARIMA models. Uh, but yeah, uh, it, it's like, to my understanding, like it is learning, but uh, you may want to look further, look further into that, because that, that is a very excellent question. <laughs> And then uh, uh, one more question before we, we move on, because we've got about 15 minutes of scheduled time left. Um, have, you, have you seen anyone using or you yourself using wavelets to extract features from time series signals? Wavelets. I'm, I'm assuming that's like similar to... I'm assuming uh, is that like a Python library or um, is is that a Python library for like signal processing? Um, Raphael, if you are listening to us, if you can confirm that, um, I think he's I think Raphael's on one of our live streams. Um, so uh, if we can get confirmation on that, we can come back to your question and. Uh, and, and get that answered. But uh, with that, let's go ahead and, and continue so that we can make sure to try to try to wrap up on time. Um, yep. And then um, we'll, we'll answer questions at the end. Yep, absolutely. Um, so now uh, residual analysis, uh, I'll, I'll go into it. So essentially like a residual is the difference between a predicted value and the actual value. And um, the behavior of these errors are pretty important because it can deter, it can essentially tell you a lot about the bias that's present within your current model and uh, whether you have to do some additional pre-processing in order to, um, it, some additional pre-processing in order to kind of fix it. So now when you perform your time series model, there are some like, there are some assumptions that you want to, um, sh that you should be aware of uh, with your residuals. Now um, it's debated among statisticians whether these assumptions are um, are necessary or <laughs> whether they're less important than they actually are. But I thought it would be very I thought it would be very useful just to bring it up. So essentially, you want to make sure that your your residuals are uncorrelated. They have a mean of zero. There's a consistent variance between them, and they're normally distributed. Now, the reason why this is particularly important, again, is to demonstrate that there's an absence of bias within your model. And if there, um, and essentially kind of gives your uh, your model like a little bit more, I suppose like so a little bit more, um, uh, it allows your model to have like a better fit, uh, gives it like a little bit more credibility. Uh, so, so residual analysis uh, can provide uh, some important um, some important assumptions about your model after you after you trained and fit it. So it's something to keep in mind. Again, like the importance of it is is hotly debated, but it's something I thought that would be very useful to bring up. And uh, so, and uh, going with the Dickey Fuller test, there's also the I guess it's pronounced Lejeune Lejeune. Young, <laughs> the young box test. I, I need to, um, I need to type that into Google, uh, into Google pronunciation to see <laughs> how um, how to pronounce it because I've been reading it in my mind the whole time. <laughs> um, so essentially, this test is used to see if autocorrelation is present within your 
uh, within your data, it's it can be used to check uh, whether your residuals are uh, autocorrelated with each other, and um, and essentially like uh, the null is that it's independent, and then the alternative is that there is like serial correlation that is present within your uh, within your data set. So it's important to keep that in mind. Again, like this is another test that's hotly debated amongst uh, amongst statisticians as to as to whether it's uh, valid or not. But again, like it's something I wanted to bring to your attention just to say, like it's this is a tool that you can use to check for autocorrelation within your residuals uh, when you're performing the analysis. Um, I suppose uh, I, I suppose uh, the next section is going to be very dense. So if there are any additional questions for the like the residual analysis, I'll get them out of the way right now. Uh, yeah, so how do you test? Um, how do you how do you test if there uh, if seasonality is effective and relevant um, mm. when most data are or is not explicit? Is there a test to confirm? if this component must be included? Uh, that is good. I will be getting into that uh, okay. later. We'll save so it. essentially, without spoiling what's going to come up next, we're going, in, we're going to go into autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation functions. And I wouldn't say there are definitely tests that exist, but you can check uh, through the decomposition if there is seasonality present. Uh, you can see like in this graph, like if, if it's very consistent that there might be a seasonality component you'd want to add, but you can actually see, um, but autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation functions will give you an idea of the seasonality that is present within your data set. So I'll get into how to kind of um, eyeball it. But again, I want, I want to like emphasize that this is like the autocorrelation, the partial autocorrelation, it's like the, um, there are, processes to like analyze them but they shouldn't be taken as gospel like you shouldn't be like oh um my uh the order is this because uh the order is that the best order is definitely this like still some experimentation is uh i recommend some experimentation but yep uh good question uh i will get into it in more depth later okay and um Raphael asked a follow-up question to his question about wavelets. So maybe let me know if this helps or not. Um, mm. But they said, depending on the time window, moving averages may not capture the essence of the signal. How efficiently can wavelets be used to capture the time series signal features? Gotcha. So like, I'm assuming he's talking about spectral analysis of time series where, um, uh, where you analyze like time series as a signal rather than as a rather than as like a like an analytical process or rather than like a collection of data and um it is uh and it is um i should say like spectral analysis for time series is something that's uh heavily researched on and again, as uh, I'll reiterate this, uh, Facebook Profit actually does incorporate uh, certain aspects of signal processing uh, to their uh, to their time series modeling library in order to uh, predict seasonality. So I would definitely say that, like looking at a time series as a signal in in that kind of um, in that kind of context, like can provide like a lot of value to you, uh, to particular models that you're using. Again, like I really, really wanna uh, talk about uh, the more advanced, cause this is like, again, like the, the key uh, word in this presentation is basics. Uh, <laughs> these are foundations of, of time series, but, uh, but time series starts to get really, really, uh, well, it, it already is interesting, but it starts to get really, really fun to read papers on as things get more advanced with, uh, with topics like that. Yeah. And Raphael, um, uh, way back, and I, I feel like it was way back. It may have only been like a year or a year and a half ago. We did have a webinar on signal processing. I cannot remember what it's called because we've probably done a hundred webinars since then. Um, but um, uh, I know we did one and it'll be on our tutorial site somewhere. And maybe that has something in the, that can help you out. Um, but just my thought there. And then um, uh, last question before we, we move on. Um, and, and Daniel's 
taking us back to uh, decomposition. So uh, first, sorry to take you back. Um, when you decompose the time series by differenti differenti differentiating and fit to AR1, there's a couple of other uh, abbreviations in there. Um, is this also an ARIMA or ARMA model? And then there is a comment that they said, I meant making stationary by differencing. Okay. Um, so basically when you decompose, I wouldn't really say that, um, I wouldn't really say that they're using a model to decompose. It's more so like they find these, uh, they find these specific trends through various ways. And then, um, and then they uh, process the time series with those uh, with those trends. So um, so that that's a that's a very excellent question. So I wouldn't say like it is possible to decompose like the um, the autoregression, the moving average, and the integration with your uh, with your REMA model um, with your REMA model. Like it's possible to decompose with that, but with with that uh, with the with that decomposition, I wouldn't assume that they would use. Uh, uh, that that type of modeling method to um to to find like specific parts of it they 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 have like their own internal processes in which they do that yeah that is an excellent question i do i do want to look uh more into how specifically they find those things but that is a very good question okay uh i think we can save the rest for the end so i think we should uh make sure we get through the rest of the presentation and then uh, for anybody else, if you ask questions, uh, we'll try our best to answer them at the end. Yep, absolutely. So uh, the first thing I want to go over, um, so autocorrelate, so there are multiple plots that we can use to determine the order of our specific time series. Now, this is where you can kind of determine what uh, the, the fundamentals of what's going on within your time series. So the first thing I want to go into is autocorrelation. Now, this essentially takes the correlation between the current value and the previous value. And by doing that, it um, you essentially have an idea of how uh, your values are going to be interacting with one another. And this is particularly important for capturing um, how many moving average terms we would like in our equation, because it gives you an idea of the significant shocks between one value and the other, and how and what you would uh, what would be beneficial to put uh, and the number of terms that would be beneficial to put in our particular model. Uh, and you can kind of see that there's like a particular drop off here. Uh, so this is an example of a um, of an autocorrelation function where there isn't really any uh, significant, any interesting behavior. Like this is how we would expect most uh, most autocorrelation functions to to behave. Uh, and then this is like when there's some uh, interesting behavior, uh, interesting shocks. You can see like a significant drop off of two. So you'd want to uh, a significant drop off after two. So you'd want to have like an order of two within your uh, for your moving average. Now, partial autocorrelation function, similar to the previous, uh, so this is uh, this essentially finds the correlation term between the current selected lag and the time series as a whole by removing all the intermediary um, or the current selection, the current lag and the um, and the uh, the current lag and this and a selected lag. Now, um, this is important because it removes all of the intermediary uh, influence or correlations in between. So you just have uh, those two that interaction. Now, this is important because it determines how many. Um, essentially how many lags we would want to consider within our particular uh, within our particular model or our regressive model, and. Um, and determining the amount of lags like we want to that we want to consider will determine how many terms that will be in our uh, auto regressive the auto regressive port the auto regressive portion of our equation, and you can find it uh, very similarly. And this is important because you want terms that are significantly correlated in order to capture that um, in order to capture that within our equation. So you can kind of see. Um, the partial autocorrelation, like this is how you'd expect it to act, similar to the previous one. And then after two, it, there's a significant decrease. So our order would be two in this, uh, in the, our, our autoregressive order would be two in this scenario. 
Now, um, going uh, going to the previous one, you want to look for you want to look for uh, the geometric decays uh, within uh, within one of the ACFs or the PC PACFs plot. Because that that is because the geometric decay with one significant drop off will will uh, determine that the specific one is zero or the specific order within your equation is zero. If there are ge geometric decays with both, it's best practice to have the orders for both your um, autoregressive and your moving average terms be one. So going through, so I'll go through it a little bit more slowly. If there's a geometric decay with the ACF, but there's a significant drop off with the PACF. Then your um, then your the order of your autoregressive portion of your model will be whatever term there was before that drop off, and um, uh, vice versa. Uh, if there is uh, a geometric decay with your PACF, but your ACF has a significant drop off after a particular order, your moving average order will be that um, will be that lag before that significant drop off. And then uh, if both geometric decay, if both your PACF and your ACF have experienced geometric decays, then your ARMA order will both be one for your autoregressive and your moving average uh, portions of your model. Now, this is where we get into fun stuff, because this is where we look at the seasonality using PACF. So previously, we were asked, is it possible to test your model with, uh, for seasonality? The answer is yes. So in this particular case, you can see um, you can see significant spikes at certain areas within, uh, within your model with the geometric decay. So in these particular examples, the non-seasonal versions of these models are like um, are possibly going to be uh, zero or one one because in both these examples you can see like the geometric decays. However, with these spikes at each uh, at four, our period here is going to be assumed to be four. Now. Um, now, seasonality is present within our model. We might want to do a seasonal difference, and that is called the seasonal integration. And essentially how a seasonal difference is done is it the difference between the beginning period and the ending period lag uh, together. So you can kind of consider it like very similar to our regular non-seasonal differencing, except the seasonal differencing is spread out through, um, through different lags. Now, um, now you can see the trends that are present in the previous one can be translated to the seasonal components. You can see for the partial autocorrelation, there are two uh, two seasonal lags before it hits zero, while in the autocorrelation there's a drop off. So our um, our seasonal uh, autoregression autoregression order is going to be two for this one, and. The same thing is here where our seasonal moving average order is going to be two because after two seasonal lags, it drops off. And then our exponential, um, and then our exponential uh, autocorrelation is uh, is going to be exponentially decaying for the PACF. So it's going to, so our seasonal moving average is going to be zero for this one. And our, uh, my bad, our seasonal autocorrelation is going to be zero for this one. And our seasonal moving average for this one is going to be two. So yeah, uh, very dense. Um, I'm going to stop here and ask uh, any questions because we're almost because we are going a little bit over. Actually, should I just finish up before before we do questions? If you are talking, you are muted, uh, Nathan. You know what? I'll um, I'll finish up before uh, asking any additional questions. Uh, uh, Nathan's has Nathan's been having a little bit of trouble with his uh, with his Zoom, so I'll I'll finish up and then I'll uh, answer any questions at the at the end. So, going over, uh, we spoke about um, the different components of the time series uh, decompositions um, into trends, cycles, seasonality, and noise, and um, the different components of um, of like of the autoregressive moving average, what they mean, and how to and what the and how to find the proper orders, and the what integration is, and why we want to have it, 
and as well as as well as why we want to capture those seasonal counterparts within our uh, within our time series plot. And we also went over like how important the ACFs and or the autocorrelation functions and partial autocorrelation functions are in order to find the orders of the autoregressive and moving uh, moving average components of our model, as well as the seasonal uh, uh, counterparts of those components. Now, this is kind of uh, where I want to go into the next steps of where I recommend um, you going after your after your particular um, but like once you're done like with this material this is where i recommend going so you want to so there's single double and exponential smoothing that you can use with your models uh this is a really cool uh forecasting technique based on exponential equations rather than the linear modeling we previously used there's a vector autoregression and vector autoregression uh, autoregressive moving average models so there's var models and varma models remember when i said like it's possible to have like cross-sectional and time series data that's uh, why this is particularly useful. And then uh, Facebook profits, it, it's a very advanced time, a very sophisticated time series modeling library. That's really, really cool. I recommend looking into it. And then recurrent neural networks and long-term short memory networks, which are um, essentially like the deep learning counterpart to this. So this is kind of like where I recommend going afterwards. And I'm very happy that you stayed. Uh, I do have a uh, code, but time is, time is up. I will be, um, I, I can answer like a bit of the, some of the questions while, um, if, if, uh, if I'm permitted, like I will be answering some of the additional leftover questions. Yeah, we can take, we can take a couple minutes, answer a couple questions and then, and then we'll bug out. We just want to make sure we're respectful of your time mostly um, and, and making sure we get you back to work in a timely fashion. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, so uh, first question here and let me go through them because we had a few come in and we answered that one so we're going to filter that out we'll filter that one out um, so this person um, they're using Facebook profit for fitting a model uh, for their noisy data um, and make predictions and compare for finding anomalies uh, should they smooth the data and remove extreme values before training? Um, so it, it's always something worth uh, worth trying. I wouldn't say like outright remove uh, remove extreme values because um, because like outright removing values will mean that your time series is going to have like periods where it's going to be zero and then you'd have to, uh, and you have to like redistribute your time, which might not fit your business uh, evaluations. But it is possible to like to perform certain transformations on your time series prior to fitting that may provide a better, that may provide uh, a less influence from that particular outlier. Like I think Boxcox is very popular, logarithmic transformations, exponential transformations, and, and maybe, um, well, differencing is, is is going to be very difficult, but maybe some of those uh, transformations might help you out a little bit. And um, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, so I guess that that would be my advice. Like, kind of look into those different transformations to see how to how to properly uh, pre-process those um, the those outliers or the extreme noise in your data. Okay, um, and then I think this is a couple of yes or no questions all in one. So um, is autocorrelation analysis a tool to confirm seasonality? Um, yes, it can. Well, confirm, um, it can uh, show that there is like seasonality presence or season, seasonality present within your, within your time series. So I would definitely say, um, I would definitely say that it, it is something that can be used to, to find it. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Okay. And then um, I'm, I'm not sure this next part of the question. Um, could you, could you use it as a decision for a seasonality component? A decision? Uh, I, I would say so. I would okay. say, I would say it would be, it would be very useful to say, like, it'd be very useful in determining whether your model, whether you'd want to, whether a, a Serema model would be more appropriate than an Arima model in a particular mm -hmm. scenario. 
Okay, and then our last question before we close out, uh, how else can you check for seasonality apart from visual examination? How else can you check for seasonality apart from visuals? And uh, what was the, what was the uh, last word? Apart from uh, visual examination. So I imagine just visually examining your, yep. your trends. Um, so what's cool about the ACF and PACF plots is it kind of adds that, um, again, it's a little bit subjective, but it kind of adds those uh, these confidence intervals within them. Uh, these blue confidence intervals right here that can kind of check to see if like a particular lag is significantly correlated or not. And by see by noticing patterns with these uh, with these particular lags, like you'll be able to identify, you'll be able to essentially like kind of confirm if there's uh, if there's like a particular seasonality within your uh, within your data at this amount of uh, at this amount of lags. So. So you can kind of look at the pattern here and the pattern of significance to see if there is seasonality present. And you can kind of use that to, to bolster your explanation. OK, sounds good. So I think we can wrap up there, Alex. I know you have a couple of links about how to get in touch with you. Do you want do you have any kind of final words about maybe about Illuminate AI or um, where the code is on GitHub? Yeah, so I will, um, I will, so I can send a GitHub link to you. Uh, so I'll upload all of this stuff to GitHub, um, to GitHub right after the presentation, and I'll send uh, the GitHub link to you for, uh, for you to share so that everybody can have uh, both the slides, the code, or not even both, uh, the slides, the code, the activity exercise, some data sets, as well as the, um, as well as the uh, dashboarding, uh, as well as the dashboard uh, example. So, Perfect. yep, I, I will upload all this to uh, to GitHub. Uh, Illuminate AI is a really cool uh, group. Basically, I share a bunch of articles that I find very interesting and that may uh, help you out in various aspects. And uh, follow me on LinkedIn, please, because it is because um, I'm trying to make some more, uh, I'm posting more commonly, trying to make some more uh, cool Python tips and then posting about data science on a regular basis. So yeah, I'd love, I'd love it if you could give me either a follow or a connection request. Sounds good, sounds good. And, and everyone, just so that you know, uh, with the recording, we will post these things as resources with the recording. So you'll be able to find the GitHub link, Alex's, Alex's LinkedIn profile, you can already find on our website. And uh, same with Illuminate AI, we'll post that as a resource as well. Alex, I'm going to steal the screen from you for just a second so I can introduce next week's, mo um, not model, but, but webinar. Um, here we go. So next week, March 28th at 9 a.m. Pacific, so an hour earlier than today, uh, we will have Dmitry Ustalov. And Dmitry, I'm sorry, I know we've met once before, and I'm sorry if I butchered your last name, uh, but Dmitry is going to be uh, building robust machine learning models from noisy labeled data. Uh, we're going to talk about how to properly account for noisy data, how to take into account the subjective responses, and then how to track distribution bias using model monitoring. Um, uh, we really encourage you to sign up and, um, you know, come build a robust machine learning model with us. So um, Dimitri is the head of ecosystem development unit at Tolica. Um, he has 14 years of experience in natural language processing and is, al is also a PhD. Um, so a great guy to learn with, uh, really fun to talk with as well in the, in the calls I've had with him leading up to his webinar. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Alex. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, hopefully we can have you back again sometime and um, for everybody else thank you so much for being here taking an hour out of your data uh, to be with us there will be a recording um, everything alex mentioned about github um, his linkedin profile and illuminate ai we will add as resources uh, to the um, uh, to the recording and that will also include the slide deck because i know a couple of people asked about that so alex thank you so much for being here we'll let you get back to work and i hope you have a good rest of your day thank you you too